And let's talk about poor Los Lobos. They're going to get the throw right here. Let's talk about Los Lobos, who, as far as I know, are fine, upstanding gentlemen. Um, not in any way to be tarnished. Uh, mm -hmm. Josh, go ahead and uh, tell us what songs you used and uh, take us away. Yes, Los Lobos, How Will the Wolf Survive uh, from 1984. And in the opening montage, you will hear the title track, Will the Wolf Survive? And now you're going to hear I Get Loaded. Actually, it's I got loaded. <laughs> <laughs> I get loaded. I got loaded. It's all the same, Josh. Yeah. All right. All Los right. Lobos. What are the numbers? numbers? Yeah, yep. some numbers here. So Los Lobos, not to be confused with Los Locos from Short Circuit 2. Oh, um, God. What a, <laughs> what a reference. I'm uh, cutting that. <laughs> <laughs> no, somebody out there knows what I'm talking about. Uh, all right, so How Will the Wolf Survive comes in at number 608 in the 1980s on Best Ever Albums, number 67 in 1984, number 3977 of all time it is actually Los Lobos second highest rated album on best ever albums behind 1992's Kiko uh, this album did not make Rolling Stones list and Los Lobos is ranked number 1222 of overall artist rankings on best ever albums so um, John is this where are we getting Los Lobos from here how'd you pull this I think we added it for a more representative amount of artists. You know what I mean? Different okay. genres. And yeah. that was how it happened. Yeah. So this is a John special. Sort yeah. of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Los Lobos. Uh, this album was released in October of 1984. This was, uh, the band was formed in 1973 um, by two guys um, who met in high school. David Hidalgo, who's the lead guitar and uh, vocals, a lead vocalist on this album, as well as accordion, and Louis Perez, um, also on vocals and drums. They met in high school in East L.A., and they bonded over music like Fairport Convention and Randy Newman and Ry Cooter, who we've all talked about or mentioned in previous episodes. And uh, they started writing and playing songs together um, just while hanging out. And then later that year, they uh, recruited some more members from from school to play uh caesar roses um who's on vocals and guitar and mandolin among other instruments and conrad lozando from uh, who play who's also on vocals everybody in the band sings and uh on bass and then francisco frank gonzalez also joined um to complete the lineup so it was the five of them gonzalez was in the lineup from 73 to 76 but never appeared on any of the recordings and um, the four of them um, that I just mentioned are the core members and they are all still in the band um, so they are they are really Los Lobos um, and there's been some other people that have joined them and and left but they have always maintained the uh, core lineup now uh, this is a band that is really um, you know put the the blue collar work ethic into being musicians because they uh were around for a long time before they they put out this album which is technically their it's not technically their first album but it's their first major release album um, their very first album was self-released and titled los lobos del este de los angeles and was recorded in 1977 over four months and it came out in 1978 and at that time the band members all had day jobs and um, los lobos would really uh, play weddings and at restaurants all over East LA, basically from their inception uh, in 73 all the way to 1980. Um, as far as their repertoire, they would start out playing American Top 40, but then um, they would experiment uh, with traditional Mexican music, um, which received a positive reaction when they would incorporate that into their playlists um, or set lists and Louis Perez said quote if you were married between 1973 and 1980 in East LA we probably played your wedding so they were really the one band that that uh you know that we've talked about that was a wedding band um, and 
in some sense um, as an act. They originally called themselves Los Lobos del Este de Los Angeles, but then shortened it to Los Lobos. Um, there were some other bands in LA at the time that had variations on those names and directions. Um, so I think that was a good call. Their first big public appearance was in 1980 at Olympic Auditorium in LA, opening for Public Image Limited in September of 1983. Uh, or wow, that's yeah. a that's a what, lineup. I can't even imagine what I mean. Talk about different <laughs> music for <laughs> for the band, but yeah, that was their first uh, big gig. And in September of 1983, they released an EP titled. And a Time to Dance, which is co-produced by T-Bone Burnett and Steve Steve Berlin on Slash Records. Uh, we've talked about T-Bone -Bo, Burnett before, um, and he appears on this album as well um, that we're talking about tonight. This, uh, this brought the band its first wide acclaim, um, ending up in the Village Voices EP of the Year, and also their famous Paz and Jot poll of the albums of the year. Um, as I've said before, if you haven't looked at those archives, they're always a good spot for basically all of the albums that we've talked about have been mentioned, and especially post-punk and punk and kind of all that pre pre indie music that um, that uh, they they bring bring up. They also won a Grammy for best Mexican American song in 1984 for the song "En Salma" off of the EP. And uh, sales of the EP earned them enough money to buy a van and tour around the U.S. for the first time. So this is a band that really, like, man, their work ethic, they just kept keep on keeping on and finally got a van. Um, not not a rise to the top quickly. Down by the river. For them. Yep. <laughs> In the summer of 1984, they returned to the studio to record this album, How Will the Wolf Survive? The album's title and title song were inspired by a National Geographic article entitled where Can the Wolf Survive?, um, which the band members were related to their own struggle to gain success in the U.S. while maintaining their Mexican roots. Um, as I said before, Steve Berlin and T-Bone Burnett both appear on this album. Berlin plays the sax and ends up joining the band um, after leaving the L.A. band The Blasters, um, which is also kind of a notable L.A. band. And uh, Ber T-Bone Burnett produces the album as well as playing the acoustic guitar and the organ on this album. Um, they were, uh, you know, after this album came out, they were continued to expose to a wider audience opening for the clash and the blasters. Um, Steve Berlin, um, as I said, left the blasters to join Los Lobos when he, um, found he had a lot in common with their, their musical, um, interests and, uh, you know, albums they liked and all five of the members, including Steve Berlin are still in the band today. Um, do you, uh, so a little trivia here, do you remember when else uh, we've talked about Slash Records and some of the artists that were on that label? I, Any I, ideas? I don't remember, no. Wow, okay. I don't that's know. Deep, that's a deep cut. Yep, they are kind of a, they're an L.A. Uh, label and Gun Club and Violent Femmes were also on Slash Records. Uh, oh, okay. In uh, 1987, they released a second album, By the Light of the Moon, and also recorded the Richie Valens covers for the movie La Bamba, including the title track La Bamba. So I think that's where probably 99% of people know Los Lobos from, is from the from that song. Um, that song hit number one, as well as two other covers that they performed for the uh, movie Come On, Let's Go, and Donna also charted, and you can see... Um, Lou Diamond Phillips play Richie Valens in that movie and sing those or lip sync those songs, I imagine, um, in the movie. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> the, uh, in 1988, their third album, La Pistola y el Corazón, which is the gun in the heart, featured original and traditional Mexican songs and got them their second Grammy for Bex Best Mexican American Album. And uh, they really continued on uh just making albums and touring um, in the late 80s and 90s they toured around the world and opened for bands like Bob Dylan U2 and Grateful Dead and released uh, many albums in the, in those decades they won Grammy for best children's album in 1995 for an album called Papa's Dream and uh, they also scored their Robert Rodriguez film Desperado um, starring Antonio Banderas um, in 
into the 2000s, they continued to tour and release albums. Um, they have uh, about 18 albums um, to their name at this point, um, you know, to current day. In 2015, they were nominated for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but as of yet, they are not in, uh, induct inducted into it. Um, their newest album, I will say, is called Native Sun. It was released in 2021, and it's their 18th album and features songs all written and recorded by artists from LA such as Beach Boys, Jackson Brown, Buffalo Springfield, The Blasters, Willie Bobo and uh, they have an original song on there as well and um, I'm happy to report that all the band members are still alive and performing so no tragic uh, uh, deals with you know Un circumstances or drugs or anything like that they're all alive and kicking um, original member frank gonzalez did die in 2022 or this year um, but uh, other than that that's uh they are the definition of touring musicians that have seemingly performed with everybody and done a wide range of uh, different types of albums and um, pretty interesting career um, from what the research that i've done so I never listened to a Los Lobos album before. I, I don't know if you guys have, but what did you think of How Will the Wolf Survive? Matt, you can start. Okay. Um, well, it's funny that, first of all, I have to clean the stack because this is on Rolling Stone's top 100, 500 list. Oh, uh, okay. It comes in number 431, so okay. um, I missed that. Uh, it's funny you mentioned that they started off playing all these weddings because it's that so fits the bill for what, I was kind of experiencing listening to this in terms of like the, you know, I was talking to Sherry and we kept saying like, this just seems like music that would be great to hear in a bar somewhere. Right. Yeah. And that, mm -hmm. and that by, you know, correlation there, like a wedding, you know, like a real fun time there. I, I, I did like this record. They're mixing up a lot of stuff, right? That, so it starts right off with a straight up blues song. Like the yes. opening track is all right. They're, and they blues rock in the second. Uh, so that's don't worry, baby. The second song, a matter of time is kind of a slower down version of a blues song. And then they start going into kind of more of the, you know, the Mexican sounds and which, which is kind of like a combination of like, the Mexican music along with polka. <laughs> it's yeah. like with the accordion, the very upbeat. And mm -hmm. I, I never really thought about the uh, the connection of, or the similarities between Mexican music and polka music, but it's certainly there and apparent in a couple of these songs here. And then you've got a song like Our Last Night, which is a country song complete with slide guitar. Yep. Um, and they just really, they, they mix all of these different genres together for a real easy listen. I mean, this is, there's so many records that we've listened to where I felt I need to listen to this many times and kind of pick apart what's going on here. And how do I feel? This was not that this was on one listen. I was like, yep, this is straight ahead. This is clearly not reinventing anything. This is recycling things and putting them to putting them together in kind of a unique way that pretty much flows nicely throughout the record. Um, there was not one song in here that I disliked. I, I liked the the tenth song, the penultimate song, if you will, was a nice little kind of waltz with a kind of a combination of just like an Americana mandolin, but also had like a little bit of a a baroque medieval kind of sound to it. I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Little the king of everything. The That's... little king of everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then Will the Wolf Survive? The beginning of that sounds kind of like a Spring Sings type like anthemic rock song. Um, I got loaded was funny. That's just, you know, it's just talking about getting hammered on a bottle yep. of gin. So, I mean, I, so it's an easy listen. It's fun. It's upbeat. Um, it's, I, I, I could, you know, I, I, like I said, I think I mostly would enjoy this, like going out and like at a night on the town or whatever and hearing like a band playing this in a bar somewhere and, and having a lot of fun. Um, I don't know how often I'll go back to this having said all that, but, um, it's certainly, it, it, it's you know got that you know that country americana stuff that i like um and just fun i didn't know any of the songs i didn't really know anything about los lobos but this was you know, i was surprised in the variety that i was getting here and how it just all flowed really well together um so uh but yeah in the in the certain moods and stuff like that i could i could go back to it i just i don't know it's it's not going to be at the top of my list but it's it's really solid it's really good and it was fun and it's kind of like a little bit of a of a palate cleanser with all of the you know post-punk we've been doing and kind of more artistic rock it's kind of nice to get something that's just a basic you know um blues country you know type sound that's uh really easy to listen to so i'm thumbs up on this i, li I like this quite a bit 
Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it, Matt, because I didn't enjoy it very much, to be quite <laughs> honest. I, um, oh, come on. <laughs> I appreciate the grind, um, yeah. and I appreciate also being taken to another genre of music. Uh, I wouldn't say that music that would be in any way defined as um, Latin American, right, or Mexican in general has is a problem for me um, to this point. I mean, how many... We Carlos Santana and Santana, right? We're Mexican American. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of other bands that would. Uh, I I don't know if I'd call Ush Mutantes as a Portuguese, right? Because they're Brazilian. Um, but we haven't really been in the world of like Latin American music. You know, I think in like the Does Getz and O-O's, Gilberto fall in there. Getz and Gilberto, they're yeah, also but they're Brazilian. I mean, yeah, yeah, they're Brazil. So I mean, yeah, so it's kind of. And they're also in jazz, which is well, another... Ge- Gilberto is not Getz. Gilberto, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it gets his from, like, Queens or something. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but, um, but um, yeah, and I know in the OOs, for example, we're going to do, like, Juanes, right, and Mana. And then in 2010s, you know, we're going to do, um, uh, I think, like, um, Bad Bunny and stuff is mm-hmm. in there. So there's just different stuff in different genres. I will fully admit that this type of music which i the i mean i was thinking of it and i was like this is like you know restaurant slash wedding music you know yeah. sort mm-hmm. of and it's it's so universalized to scenes that to me are commercialized versions of latin american culture that i i really did not want to undersell it because that's where i hear it though so but it was it was very it was very hard to hear it outside of the context of those venues in the mm-hmm. same way that certain other things I think get niched a little bit for me in like the context of where I hear them, like some like AOR and stuff would be in that and um, different types of music and stuff like that. I, the instrumentation, I'll start by saying this. I, for some reason, the singer's voice just really, did nothing for me. It, it was kind of the same on every single song. It always sort of sounded like it was singing like a like a longing love song a little bit, regardless mm-hmm. of what the music was behind it, um, which kind of at times didn't sync up for me a little bit. Um, I liked the songs that were more ballads than I liked the up-tempo songs, actually. And so I would say if I was picking the songs that I liked the, the most, it would be Evangeline was probably the song I liked most mm, on here. Mm-hmm. I would say Will the Wolf Survive was probably the other song. Then there were certain songs like, you know, Corrido Number 1 or Numero Uno, if we were, <laughs> Corrido Numero Uno, or yeah, I Got go. Loaded, that I'll be very honest with you, like, did not do much for me. Mm-hmm. They sort of sounded like a bonanza of accordion and guitar and mm-hmm. um the percussion also got buried at times which frustrated me uh, it was there but like it kind of got overwhelmed by sonic elements that were not as appealing to me yeah and, and i just felt like there i know matt said there's a lot of variation i i felt there was some variation but the fact there was very little variation in terms of the singing style it was just in that one lane right of almost singing like a like a ode or a, a, a longing ode, right? Like singing about yep. something, romanticizing it. Um, no matter what was there, it kind of um, wore me out after a while. Um, so I can't say I necessarily recommend this one. I can't say I'm, I disliked it. I, I just, this definitely falls under the category of, I do not think I will ever revisit this album it is not a genre killer for me i just think that there are ways that this type of music you know latin american music is taken that really resonate with me but they happen to be more percussion driven or instrumental um and and not as much with what i consider sort of and i don't want to like like a mariachi wedding band type sound i think is a little bit of a harder listen for me yeah yeah, I think that's fair. I um, I kind of felt the same way uh, Matt did list about this. It was uh, a lot of different genres. Um, that I got a lot of country um, out of it. I got some Zydeco, too, on like a song like The Breakdown, mm. um, which we haven't 
I mean, Dr. John didn't even have too much Zydeco in um, his <laughs> album, so that was a that was a surprise. Um, and uh, it, it's a perfectly pleasant album to listen to. I think that was the main takeaway I had was it was a band that you could play and no one would be offended by it, which is exactly what you want from a, a wedding a band yeah. that plays at a wedding. Um, you could put it on in the background and and uh, it, it would be completely pleasant. Um, I, I thought the lead singer did have a good voice. I, I enjoyed his singing. And um, the other thing uh, that we haven't mentioned is that this sounds nothing like the 80s. It, it, this could be from any decade. Yeah, it right. could be uh, oldies. I, if Los Lobos was, if somebody had told me Los Lobos was from the 60s and they, they fi- found the band and, you know, it was like behind the music and they unearth this album in the 80s and i would i would believe you uh they they really are kind of timeless in that way uh in a way that you know at least the 80s music that we've listened to at this point has has not been um it's very it's of its time for the most part um i also uh was a little i thought there'd be actually more um incorporation of 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 mexican um songs or or styles into their music and i think they do based on what i read get to that in some of their later albums i think they do entire albums that are uh, homages or takes on a traditional mexican music um i was surprised at kind of how just they really only have a little sprinkling of it and and it doesn't really even sound exactly like a traditional or stereotypical mariachi band um it's kind of light on that um like you said matt it's, there's like polka influence i guess that is the we, we shouldn't discount the german immigration influence into mexico um and what that's played um in the in the culture but the uh um i think yeah. i might have been discounting it because i wasn't as aware of it josh as, oh. as there so yep. that makes sense yep. that's really kind of where um well to get into beer history that's kind of where the the lagers and basically all of the Mexican beer styles came from is from the German immigrants who were brewing beer there. But, um, I, I really, uh, liked kind of the oldies feel to it. It was a little refreshing palate cleanser to some of the other music that we've listened to. And, um, I was, yeah. But on the other hand, like, like John said, I'm not sure it would be a band, uh, or this album I would revisit. It didn't really, wasn't experimental enough to to kind of take me to a new place there was um it just felt familiar in a way that may be unfair to los lobos but but um it's i think there were you know because of how many thousands of hours they they got playing at weddings i think they are just really good musicians who kind of play solidly that's kind of what I got from listening to the album and they're good at what they do. And uh, I guess it's a testament to their ability to blend genres that they can incorporate this into their, yeah. their music as well. Um, they are talented. We haven't heard too much accordion in many albums. So that was a refreshing um, change of pace. But uh, I think, you know, since Los Lobos is still around there, there's definitely an audience for this music. And I think they have gone on to, mine different genres and uh depths to their music so this is really i guess the is why it's in rolling stone is because this is what the band really started from and what they're all about ultimately as their foundation so i'm glad i got to listen to it but i wouldn't say it's gonna fall somewhere right in the middle of i didn't dislike it but it's not like mind-blowing type of music was the accordion like a refreshing change of pace because you wanted to hear the instrument or a refreshing change of pace because you ha- haven't heard the instrument? It's like, oh, that's a new sound. Yeah, probably probably the latter is a new sound that hasn't been incorporated too much in into albums that we've listened to. Because I sure. think for it's me, like a... the bar of correct accordion usage is a very small Venn diagram. <laughs> C, I'd have to. shanties. <laughs> I'd need to be shown where it, it it has a place in pop music as opposed to like, you know, I've been waiting for some accordion. And <laughs> yeah. here we go. Yeah. No, I, I agree with Josh. I think that that's more of a, uh, it's almost like I forget that that's an instrument, right? And yeah. when I hear it, I'm like, I like it. So if it's used, you know, 
generally speaking, if I hear it sparingly, like I don't, I'm not going to be just, you know, cranking the accordion music, you know, not 80, 70, 80%, 90% of the time when I listen sure. to music, you know, I need, I need sparse accordion, but when I hear it, it's like, oh, that's nice. And I think the other, that kind of relates to this as well is that if this was an, uh, an entire album of basically like kind of mariachi polka influence yeah. kind of thing, I would not like it be, it's, it's fine in dribs and drabs. And that's what you get here. You get maybe a couple of songs that are like that. And then you've got other blues rock, country rock, you know, kind yep. of Americana folk, even uh, rock and roll that's that's in here. That's what I like about this is because it hits all these elements that I think that generally speaking I like in 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 some doses like a basic blues song that like a bar band blues song like Don't Worry Baby. Again, if this album was all of that, I probably would not like it as much, you know. But yep. because it's doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and it mixes it up, um, I like that, right? And I think that that's that's one of the reasons I can come I can come back to this. Uh, but uh, and yeah, and I think it's just it's it's a welcomed in, you know break from a lot of the other stuff that we're getting that's has been heavy or has been really synth or really produced or right. arty or whatever and it's kind of nice just to have something a little different so that's one of some of the main reasons i liked it yep and Completely. i think they incorporated valid. yeah they, i think they incorporated some more traditional mexican instruments into into the album as well although i couldn't really um pick them out per se but uh they are they are listed on their and what they play um, for the album. So I think that was unique as well. But I don't yeah. see the mari mariachi bass on here like the Violent Femmes use. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That was not not on this album, but probably in other ones. So yeah, so it sounds like two two thumbs up and. Uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go thumbs down for me. Yeah. I'll be very honest with you. It was a thumbs tough down. list. I I um. I, I reserve the right as I listen to more albums in the genre to kind of say I undersold it and niched it, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's just more the the sounds themselves regardless mm -hmm. of... It just it came off a little bit generic to me, the album, yeah. I'll be honest. I see that. And I think what might have been a, a light listen for you guys kind of became... It crossed the Rubicon into too light and, you know, non-hefty enough for me. Yep. So mm -hmm. I think that's where it was. Not at the yep. point where I'd, I'm like, I, this album did not speak to me or, or angered or anything like that. But definitely was more like after the two listens, I was like, got it. Don't need any more of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, th I think you're closer to our feelings about it in some respects than than far away it's not like we're on polar ends or anything but yeah i get what you're saying 